oh, anything you want, and I thought maybe I should do something related to here or something, and then he saw the outline of a lecture I was giving in Istanbul, and he said, well, why don't you just give that lecture? So he, uh, he, uh, what he asks for, he gets, of course. So I'm going to give you basically the lecture that I gave in Istanbul, um, and it's about things that might seem very far away from Bodrum. Uh, although I have to say that having been here uh, for a day now, uh, it seems that you have many of the same problems that uh, not only other places in Turkey have, but that are generic all over the world. There's this very beautiful image of Bodrum. You see this incredible compact little downtown area, and then you go out, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and it keeps going, and as it goes along, the texture of what human beings have done in this landscape becomes further and further removed from the actual landscape. And that is a problem that we face everywhere. So what I want to just talk about uh, this afternoon is are the problems that architecture faces, which I think are symptomatic of much larger problems in the world as a whole, and in fact problems that are central to the world as a whole. Architects used to think that they could provide a utopia, an image of something that was perfect, and that would be the model that would help make the world a better place. Of course, whenever even a fraction of one of those utopias was built, it was a disaster, uh, without a single exception. I don't know a single one. Um, and now architects are beginning to realize that they must find other ways to help make the world better. So what I want to try to do is outline what I think are some of the issues and uh, show you some of the avenues that people are pursuing. So this is utopia. Uh, at least in the 2018 version, <coughs> this is what I would think that most people would think would be the kind of architecture we should dream of a perfectly organic world in which nature and human-made artifacts are completely blended together in an eternal springtime in which you can imagine everyone is wandering around naked and in love with each other. As some of you might know, does anyone recognize this image? I don't know if anyone is a movie goer here. Yes, yes, yes. Yes? This is, uh, I'm just trying to to, to, to remember the, the it's one of those futuristic films that we yeah. draw. Yes. yes. It's a it's a movie called uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yes. yes. Unfortunately it's part two, the second one, which is a terrible movie. The first one was quite good. <laughs> but it has this vision and it turns out that actually this is all the brain of this Nietzschean Ubermensch who controls the universe and his brain is actually this planet. So it is this absolutely impossible, thoroughly fictional affair. So this is what we think of as the ideal of architecture, and this is the ideal of architecture that is actually built. This is the most perfect building in the world. I have no qualm saying this. It is perfect because it's perfectly round. It's the perfect omega. It is absolutely gorgeously detailed, and it is unbelievably expensive. It cost about a billion and a half dollars, depending on who you talk to. And of course, it's the headquarters of Apple Computers, which also makes it the most important building in the world, because we all know that Apple is the most important company in the world. And it is this endless Gilbert land where people race around in their little cubicles, running into glass walls. This perfect panoptagon, and I have no doubt that Stephen Jobs is buried right in the middle, still trying to control this complete empire that he has built up. <coughs> except, 
except that even before this building was finished, they had to build this piece of shit, excuse my language, <laughs> because, and I hope no one here designed it, I don't think it would be very unlikely, but uh, just in case. Um, the, this is the office building they had to build a few miles down the road because you can't build a perfect architecture. As soon as you build it, it winds up having problems, needs change, and the whole building already is out of date as soon as it's finished. People who work there hate it exactly because it is so perfect. This kind of perfect architecture becomes the tomb of architecture, this building does. And this for me is a very specific problem to architecture, which is that the buildings become the tomb where architecture goes to die. All of the aspirations, all the dreams, all the ideas that we have that architecture is going to change the world are buried inside buildings. But of course, the other problem that we have to confront is that what they control from that those buildings, is this, the Apple iPhone. And it and all of its other devices, uh, all of the other phones, all of the other computers, all of the other computer, computer and communication technology that connects us all together, is creating an architecture that is fundamentally different than that of the beautiful stones and wood out of which this house is built. And make no mistake, it is an architecture. It is an, archi an architecture that is everywhere and nowhere at the same time, but it has all of the aspects of architecture. It has a set of social relations. It establishes a relationship between you and other human beings in the world. It has communities. It has places where you belong. It has all of the aspects of architecture without the bricks and mortar. And, of course, most of us spend a lot more time on Facebook, uh, uh, WhatsApp, WeChat, Tinder, Grindr, whatever it is you spend your time on, that's really the reality in which most people live. But that, again, is only a symptom of this much larger problem of the complete dis disintegration of traditional social, political, economic, family relations. We indeed live in a world that Karl Marx predicted more than 100 and well, almost now, almost 175 uh, years ago, in which all that is solid melts into air, in which companies and countries, even human beings and certainly families and social relations, all dissolve in this concatenation of human relations that spreads from here all over the world. And the symptom of that in architecture, of course, is sprawl, is that spread of Bodrum that I mentioned at the beginning, is the fact that every day, everywhere in the world, we are continually using up natural resources to build ever more on ever less open space. And this is the fundamental crime of architecture right now. We live in a planet that is rapidly destroying itself, and that's no longer a fiction or a fear. That's something that is happening to us right at this moment. And architecture, or at least construction, is, depending on who you talk to, the third or seventh largest polluter in the world. It is incredibly wasteful, not only in how it builds, but also what it builds with. And even if you were to make a net zero building, you would still be using up natural resources and polluting the planet just by bringing the concrete and the steel onto the site. And you would be using up open space that we can no longer afford to give up. Everywhere in the world, we are destroying ourselves, our society, our nature, by building ever more in ever less sustainable ways. And it happens right here in Turkey. What's interesting is I tried to find aerial photographs of Bodrum 
your tourist office is very good. It blocks all of the <laughs> photographs that might show the sprawl of Bodrum. Uh, they're all hallmarked and have things so that you can't copy them. It's Whoever runs the tourist office here should get a raise. They're doing their job very, very well. But here is obviously Istanbul, and you all know the insanity of Istanbul, the forests that are being cut down, the incredible sprawl of this city that is destroying vast parts of one of the historically most important uh, landscapes in the world. And it just has to stop, because within this world, we live in these little isolated boxes in which we are plugged into the internet and all of our other devices. We are fed by water and sewage systems and by air conditioning systems, but we are completely isolated. And that's the other problem with this world. It is socially isolating and visually unbelievably ugly. Someone might recognize this as well, but I'll just, rather than, we could raffle off another book if anyone knows <laughs> where, what this is from. Uh, this was a series called Breaking Bad, which was an American television series. And it was set in Albuquerque, so when I went to Google, scenes from Breaking Bad or Breaking Bad Albuquerque, what's ironic is that the first thing you get is two different companies that offer tours of Albuquerque where they will take you to see all the sites of this television series, which is incredibly ironic because, of course, the whole point of the series, for those of you that have ever seen it, is that there can be a math teacher in one of these suburban houses cooking up meth, while in the next house over there can be a polygamous Mormon family, and in the next house over there can be a completely normal family, and the next house over can be, um, there's actually a building that looks just like that where I get my suits tailored uh, because there's a shop in there. Everywhere is nowhere all at the same time. And what's more is it all looks a lot, exactly the same everywhere in the world, including in Turkey. I did a study uh, with my students comparing three different cities in America. And if you look at sprawl, you find that the range of colors goes from a kind of yellowish brown all the way to a reddish brown. And that is the complete range of colors. The German architect, Jürgen Meyer, did it in Germany and came up, what he, with, uh, up with what he called the Latte Manifesto uh, on this kind of brown, which of course for me associates something other than Latte, this kind of soft brown color that is spread like manure all over our environment. So here is this sprawl that is environmentally incredibly wasteful, socially separating, and incredibly ugly, and the only thing that keeps it together is not architecture that organizes it, that makes sense out of it, but is big brother or sister always watching everywhere what you're doing. And I found out in Turkey, even more so than otherwise, this place is looking almost like China. There are certain websites you can't reach and you can't get to. It's very interesting. I shouldn't even say that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because, of course, Big Brother is watching at this very moment. And if architecture has any role, it's to be completely complicit with these mechanisms of terror of isolation, of paranoia that keep this under control. And then if you ask even deeper, so here's this sprawling reality that is creating this completely artificial environment that sucks up natural resources and produces people and goods and communication <coughs> that's always moving and completely ephemeral. Who's to say that it isn't really just code that is keeping all of this running, and who is to say that we are not all caught in pods dreaming away while some alien race sucks our vital bodily fluids. We have created a completely artificial environment in which the concept of nature, the concept of what it means to be human being, the concept of organic, the concept of justice, has become malleable. 
everything has become fake news, including our bodies, which we can manipulate in any number of different ways. So in that kind of situation, what is it that architects should do? Well, the most obvious answer is to go with the flow, which is to say, if this is a world in which anything can be anything, and anywhere can be everywhere, you just understand that the work of architecture is to reassemble all of the elements of this giant hyper-object that we think of as our reality. And if any of you want to seem very hip to your colleagues and students and friends, you just start talking about triple O, which means object-oriented ontology, which is the latest theory to make sense out of this sprawling hyper-reality by proposing that we are in fact part of this interconnected system whose reality we can never know. And so architects like Mark Foster Gage try to turn that into some side of sort of solidification in building. But even beyond that, of course, the very definition of avant-garde for at least 20 years has been anything that is computer generated, which is to say, if we live in this world of flows, then go with the flow and see architecture as the perhaps only temporary solidification of all of those data flows into the blob-like realities that students for 20 years have been thinking will be the answer to their future. But of course, once these forms get built, they might have some beauty to them, like this new uh, Shanghai, uh, sorry, uh, Kowloon station for the high-speed train from Shanghai. They certainly can solidify into very elegant and slick structures, but they remain these incredibly wasteful, incredibly isolating, and quite often incredibly ugly structures that repeat the problems of sprawl, of social stratification, unsustainability, and pure ugliness. What interests me is if rather than going with the flow, you can begin to go around the flow or bend the flow or find ways to take our reality, expose its artificial nature, and begin to understand that if we live in this difficult to find sprawling world, we can find ways through mechanism like Photoshop to bring a momentary sense of sense, of logic, of a extrapolation of the world rather than an assumption that we can make it new. So if you start with the notion that you're not going to escape from this world of sprawl, you're not going to make the perfect building, in fact you're not going to make buildings at all. If I was in charge I would forbid the construction of new buildings for at least 10 years. So. Now I probably have to buy my own plane ticket back, but uh, it's, uh, I think that we should just stop a building altogether. That would be the first thing we should do. And we should rather start extrapolating out and manipulating and maybe even reimagining the past. I, I love this image because when I show it, I'm going against everything I was trained to like. This is the recreation of Franklin Wright's Larkin Building from 1904 that was destroyed in the 1930s, so beautifully recreated that you can see the raindrops glistening on the ground in front of them and the leftover papers on the desks. And to me, that kind of recreation now begins to be more and more appealing. We live in a world in which creating stage sets is as important as building a reality. This is one of my favorite pieces of architecture uh, of the last 10 years, also round, but not actually a building. It is on a building. 
to wit the Hirschhorn, an incredibly wasteful, ugly pillbox of a museum on the New York Mall that is the very embodiment of Big Brother plunked down with little sensitivity in the middle of America's capital. Um, and a few years ago, the artist Doug Aiken went and covered it for several nights with images of sprawl, with parking garages and ports, factories, apartment buildings, all-night diners, streets, desertscapes all around Los Angeles, and composed them into a piece that was called Song One, that was a love song to sprawl, in which you heard on the speakers around you continuously, I only have eyes for you. That kind of evocation to me has great power. And you can turn it into something that begins to resemble a building. This is a store designed by the Dutch firm MVRDV, uh, originally for Chanel, now being turned into Louis Vuitton. They were told that they could not create a new building they had to recreate what had been on the site. They managed to at least dissolve that historical recreation by using glass block, uh, glass brick. But the more perfect version of this is another building that MVRD, MVRDB did. Uh, after the town of Schengel called one of the partners, uh, whose name is Vinnie Maas, and they said, Mr. Maas, uh, you grew up here. And when you were nine years old, you wrote a letter to the mayor saying, our town square is terrible, and here's what we should do with our town square. And you made a sketch and sent it to the mayor, and believe it or not, we saved it. And now that you have become a world-famous architect, we want you to come back and redesign our town square. Except, we need a shopping mall. <laughs> but no one wants a shopping mall. So give us a shopping mall that goes away. Vinny Maas went to Schengel with a very good photographer. They photographed all of the buildings in this small village in Brabant. They put them all together with Photoshop, made the archetypal Schengel building, then blew it up 120% to be able to take care of the square footage, and printed it on glass. So that you have a building that is a mirage, that is there, but that is not there. And I am more and more interested in an architecture that is there, but not there. That, like this park that Fili Brown just did in Taiwan, consists of manipulations of air and scent and sound and texture. And my archetype for this is this wonderful series of photographs done by the Japanese photographer Hiroshi Shugimoto who wanted to get at the essence of something, the essence of our life. And like all architects and photographers, he felt that should be done through documentation, through reality. Architects and photographers, more than any artist, share this idea that they somehow have this difficult but fundamental relationship with what is real. Painters don't really care about it. Poets don't really care about it. They can make it up. But photographers and architects are the two cultural endeavors that have to begin and end there in some fashion. So Sukumoto went to these movie theaters, kept the lens open while the whole movie was playing so that all of the love scenes, the car chases, the soap opera that went into the story all dissolved into this perfect modernist white, this perfect dense emblem of nothingness, this zen of all of reality having been represented as being unrepresentable. Except that then your eye starts wandering and you begin to see all of the incredible detail of these movie theaters lit up by the movie itself, and you begin to see that something remains, some ghost, some specter. And for me, that's where architecture is right now. If buildings are its tomb, then I'm interested in its ghost, in its remains, 
in its bones that can become the scaffolding for many different kinds of activities. I'm interested in making a difference, in cutting, like the Lithuanian pavilion at the last Venice Biennale, which consisted of just building a blank wall in the middle of a church and putting a bench on top of some concrete pavers in front of it, a piece of emptiness that made you realize that church as well as Lithuania just in its emptiness. The more there is nothing, the more you begin to look for something. The more that the question of reality, of what is to be done, where is to be done, who is to be done, how we create something that makes sense of this world, becomes visible in mistakes, in places where things fall apart, in the misuse of public space, in the affordances that buildings allow. This is a structure by the Danish American, or sorry, the Norwegian American firm Snohetta. It's a library, but unlike this library, of course, it has no books because real libraries don't have books anymore. <laughs> it is a knowledge center. You go there, and the architecture consists not of the modernist ideal of open and flexible space, nor the designations of the prisons that tell you what to do and where to go, but rather this evocative set of forms that afford many different activities. And I love this counterbalance to the Apple headquarters. This is one of the other so-called FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, that control all of our reality. This is Facebook. And Mark Zuckerberg, the head of Facebook, went traveling around the world talking to different architects. Unfortunately, he didn't have Suha do this for him. It would be much faster. <laughs> And he finally walked into Frank Gehry's office, where I worked for a number of years, and looked around, saw the mess of all the work going around there that somehow organized itself around certain resources like printers or model making tables and into groups where people were working on projects, and said, I want this, but I need 300,000 square meters of it, maybe four hundred thousand square meters. So they built 400,000 square meters and it's now going up to 500,000 square meters of this kind of bare loft-like space that organizes itself. And what really needs to be done to allow these kind of spaces to emerge, I think, is first of all to reuse and rethink what we already have. If we're not going to build new structures. We should reuse, reimagine, reinvent, repurpose what already exists, as was done with this beautiful library. And I think that rather than fetishizing the future as some goal that will all bring us together, we should fetishize the past, not in the conservative, fictional manner of certain political parties, including in this country, but in, and certainly in my country, uh, but <laughs> rather by looking with incredible attention, as the artist David Ireland did, when he bought this very normal house in San Francisco in the 1980s, 1970s, and began burnishing it, began reinventing it, began marking all of its imperfections, all of its layers of growth, all of its contradictions, all of its inherent violence and beauty. And I think that we should think of architecture not as the projection of the new, but as the reassembly of what already exists, as the delicate and light emptying out of existing structures, highlighting what makes them have a particular character, 
bringing them quite literally to light, misusing, misinterpreting, and de- and reforming them to allow a different kind of world to emerge. I think that the most beautiful structures of the last 10 or 20 years have been those places where we have reused old houses, old factories as swimming pools, beer gardens, museums, everything that will create our world, a music academy for the Red Bull Academy made out of recycled materials. And the notion that you can find all around you materials that you can use to reassemble and extend reality is becoming more and more central to the work of architects. It's not just a question of finding leftover lumber. It's a question of creating a harvest map, as the Dutch Architects 2012 architects do, that allow you to find and figure out ways to use kitchen sinks and washing machines, tire trucks, and car seats to create the kind of new cultural community centers that we need. And these places are beginning to break down the barrier between high art, low art, rich and poor. This is a wonderful project called the Heidelberg Project, created by someone called Wade Guten in the middle of abandoned center of Detroit, using literally cast off materials to create the kernel of a renaissance within this community. This is the wonderful artist Theaster Gates, who was actually trained as an urban planner. After he got his degree, he went to Japan and learned how to be a master potter. He came back to America and got a PhD in philosophy. And of course, with that background, he became an artist working in South Central Chicago, literally finding leftover materials, reassembling them not into weirdness, but into a recall of existing reality, including the record collections and the cast-off materials that were already in that community. This is another one of my favorite projects. One of the largest uh, social housing programs in the world that people generally don't know about, is called Infonavit, and it's in Mexico. It is basically a bank that takes money from everyone's wages and then stamps out millions of units of horrible social housing, little concrete boxes that are incredibly wasteful and incredibly imprisoning and always controlled by Big Brother. About seven years ago, a new head of design came in and said, stop, no more new cookie cutter housing. We actually have enough. We just need to use them better. We need to expand them. We need to make them into livable places. And he brought some of the best young architects of Mexico together to create and recreate the whole housing project. At the other end of the spectrum, here is one of America's billionaires, the guy who owns Zappos Shoes, who lives in downtown Las Vegas in a community of Airstream trailers and movable houses in which they gather around fake grass and movie theaters to create a very light community. It's not about building walls and making boxes. It's about breaking walls and opening up boxes. It's about inscribing ourselves and finding our way in our world. This is another great artist called Mark Bradford, who went around for the series of paintings, his neighborhood in Los Angeles, picking up handbills, putting them on the canvas, smearing automobile paint on them, putting on more handbills, putting on more automobile paint, scraping them away until he wound up with what he called a map of Los Angeles, something that would allow him to understand where he was. By reusing materials, we can find a new reality. We can explode out from our preconceptions into a kind of art 
that lets us understand that it is exactly those things that seem to be useless, that seem to be disorganized, that can become the taxonomy for future forms that will rebuild the past in meaningful ways. This is a wonderful project that consists of taking all of the materials in a VW bug and abstracting them into a model for a city. The artist, um, uh, well, I just lost it. The artist, I'm just going, no, that's okay. I'm just going completely blank. Uh, never mind. Uh, this is, let's quickly go to my favorite weird project for which I have no, I always put this slide in because uh, I can't explain this project at all, but it's so fantastic. This is a chicken project uh, that was done at SciArc several years ago. It is nominally a house for the student's grandmother outside of Beijing, but it's a collection of chicken bacon, chicken parts, chicken movies, all of it assembled to create the chicken project. But that kind of assembly, that kind of evocation using found materials can even extend to using the piezoelectric energy from your body in Philip Beasley's projects to bring alive this forest of five and dye materials that you find on the street. It can happen in your computer by misreading what is on your desktop. It can find, you can find architecture by manipulating still lives from the 17th century. You could even imagine, as Francois Roche has, that architecture can reduce itself to that ghost that can then be electrostatically charged so it collects all of the pollution of Bangkok to become its protective shield. Architecture, indeed, becomes a difficult defined cloud. Architecture becomes a way of rediscovering our nature and where we are. Some of the most interesting projects for me are those places that, those projects that don't involve buildings at all, but that involve reusing existing places, piling up some leftover concrete blocks in the back of a park in Germany to create an art center and a place for a poet or an architect to talk marking a site, as in this project in Sicily, reusing an old railroad line and placing <coughs> stairs on rocks or just rocks on top of each other to measure your progress to there. And of course, the most successful of all of these projects is the High Line in New York. Mm. Certainly commercially successful, with a couple of million dollars in investment, it has unlocked about $15 billion worth of real estate development. But what's more important to me is it shows that architecture can be not the making of a building, but making accessible the buildings and the city all around you, offering you a new perspective, conflating the industrial, the geological time, destabilizing the ground plane, all just through a project of reuse that now, of course, is getting copied and taken further in projects all around the world <coughs> that involve bringing you up above the city, carving into the ground and revealing rivers, and opening up whole parts of our urban reality. This is one of the projects I'm happiest about. About six years ago, seven years ago, I was on the jury for downtown Lexington, a small town in America, this was an unused railroad yard and a set of very ugly, falling apart buildings. Uh, the uh, architect Kate Orff won with a project that involved unearthing the creek that was always still underneath the city and turning it into a park that would help bring the city and the university next to it together. I hope without those ugly buildings in the background. And they are now finally actually uh, just starting to build it. Um, all of these, I'm going real quick because I realize I'm using up a lot of time, but uh, all of these buildings have a way of reusing, unearthing, and marking the landscape. This is another uh, great project. This is an artist in uh, Phoenix where I live 
whose family owns agricultural land at the edge of the that was at the edge of the city, so they knew it was going to be taken over by sprawl, and they let him plant the crops for one season in a pattern of the neighborhood uh, that would then rise and did rise on that site. Here again is the project of Infonavit, where architecture is not just opening up those houses, but creating courtyards, this one, the Mies van der Rohe of the America's Prize, and creating a place that we can all use together. And everywhere you go in the world today, the most successful places are not the shiny new museums, not the great new um, monuments, but are rather the public spaces, the open spaces that worm their way in between. And I just saw a great example of it when I was in uh, Bergama, where Aralat designed basically a shopping mall, that's the outside of it, and then it has some theaters in the middle, which are perfectly nice, but what's really exciting is that all of the passageways between them, all of the leftover space, the space that has no particular function, is actually the part of the project that is alive, where people are gathering, where the city sees itself in a new way, where the topography is manipulated. And that is the kind of work that, to me, is most exciting. I love this project by Assemblage Studio in London, because it reminds me of a great story of a Belgian firm who was fresh out of school. They got their first project, and because they were very good and studious students, they worked very hard, and they went to this town, they studied the climate, they studied the wind direction, they studied the rain, they studied the bus lines, they interviewed all the people there, they analyzed all their data, they put it together in a big report, and at the end of the big report, they said, do nothing. <laughs> Leave it exactly the way it is. Any architecture would only alienate it from this city, would only make it worse. And here's our bill for 20,000 euros. <laughs> that, to me, is a real lesson, that doing nothing or almost nothing means not reducing forms into the most monumental abstraction, but really doing almost nothing. We all know the great public spaces of Barcelona, the great parks and boulevards and monuments that they've built since their, they started on their Olympics 30 years ago. This is the latest park, which is not in downtown, not part of all of the fancy boulevards, but is on the site of a former gun emplacement that had been taken over by illegally built houses but happened to have a spectacular view over Barcelona. And the architects who won this said, do nothing. Take only enough away that you can have the view and build only enough so people don't kill themselves. They can hurt themselves, that's okay. That will make them realize the place more. Just make sure they don't kill themselves. So, in the end, I'm interested in an architecture of unbuilding of opening up, of creating possibilities, of revealing what is hiding inside of our building, of scraping away our walls so that we can see what they are made up of, of confusing the relationship between the construction and the object, of misusing artifacts and infrastructure. Some of the best work going on in the United States right now is from architects who are flipping the script and the wall and misusing all of the details and materials to make you aware of what is there and what isn't there. Our architects who are imagining that we live in an almost dystopia that we can bring forward in a critical manner. And the concrete example of this is this project in Caracas in Venezuela. Some of you might have heard the story that was never finished, a 40-story skyscraper. One night, a group of people came in and squatted the building up to the 25th floor, took it over. The architects, who call themselves Urban Think Tank, came in and realized that their work was not to help them make that permanent 
or to bring the building up to code, but rather to realize what they were doing. To, with the help of the photographer Imran Ban, document what they were doing, to see this reimagination of architecture as the beginning of a retelling and rethinking of our reality. So, my favorite position is not to look up at the shiniest, brightest, tallest new skyscraper, but rather to be like these crazy Russian kids who climb up to the top of skyscrapers in Dubai and Singapore and Hong Kong and photograph themselves dangling over, looking down at what's already there. Because by looking at that vertiginous perspective, you see both the danger and the horror of the world we have built and its bizarre and terrible beauty that might allow us to build something else. So in my work as a writer, as a curator here in the Shenzhen Biennale, I have tried to get people to understand architecture as the reassembly, the reliving, the rethinking, the reimagining, the reuse, quite simply, of our reality. And that's a very concrete task because Already, I'm sure, in Turkey, certainly in Europe, and now also in America, something like 25%, and within the next 25 years, it will go up to over 50% of all of the architects' work will be in reuse, reimagination, rehabilitation, and adaptive reuse. So even my diktat might not be necessary, because the reality will be that architecture will become a profession, a discipline, of reuse, of assembling what we think of as junk and making it new. So that's what I'm trying to do as I sit uh, half the year in Taliesin West, outside of Phoenix, in this land of sprawl and of leftover desert, where Frank Lloyd Wright built what he called a winter encampment, taking the rocks on the site, putting them together to make a base, and then building a tent on top of it that could be reassembled every season. That's where we sit now and try to make sense of our world. And then the other five months of the uh, year, we are at uh, the original Taliesin in Spring Green, where we live and work in his house and in this studio that is a human-made version of the forest with the students living all around it. And we try to mess with it and manipulate it and have fun with it, and find ways of misusing it. But above all else, we're sitting there trying to figure, eight, uh, figure out how to make sense of this world of sprawl, how to reassemble existing materials, how to rethink what's all around us, whether physically or on the computer, how to reconnect aspects of our reality, how to tell new stories about what our world could be, but also imagine a kind of dystopian reality that might already be all around us. How we can create, this is a project that I directed for a mosque on the Via Giulia in uh, Rome that is invisible, with the one mark being the adaptive reuse of the lamppost to tell you where the mosque is. But above all else, we do it to where we actually live. Now, I cheat, because I live in an actual house with air conditioning and plumbing, but the students all around me live in desert shelters that they design and build themselves. And over the years, these have been places for experimenting with how you can reassemble the very notion of living in a way that is light on the land and that is continually reused and reinvented and rehabilitated. This is a student who graduated two years ago getting a desk script from Todd Williams and Billy Tsin, who told him that he had to completely redesign his structure, uh, and he almost started crying because he was, thought he was graduating, but luckily they let him keep the structure the way it is. This is a structure called the Atalaya, or Crow's Nest, done by a student from uh, Chile. Uh, that has become one of the most popular structures. And it's interesting because the way it works is that the students arrive in the fall back from Spring Green 
and they choose which of the existing shelters they live in. So which that was built by a student previously. And of course the ones that are picked are then maintained, as this one is, uh, even though the bed's not made, and are beautifully kept. While the other ones, like uh, this one on the left, which was built about the same time, which everyone hates for some reason, I have no idea why, uh, are already becoming ruins and fade back all into nature. Uh, so we have now a new crop of students who are trying to figure out how to build in the desert. And this was the first one that was finished. And it's a wonderful project because it's a young gentleman who worked for MVRDB and now is working for Herzog de Mohol, 70 hours a week. And he went back to the original idea of these desert shelters, which was that the students would use what Frank Lloyd Wright called desert concrete, which is you take the boulders from the site, pack them together, pour as little concrete as possible over it, and then you buy a Basque shepherder's tent and you place it on top of that, and that becomes your shelter. Except that if you look carefully, you will realize that this is actually a picture of stone printed on glass, whereas the tent is a fabric print that is put on top of metal sheeting. So that at night, what should be solid and containing glows with translucency, while the top becomes the place that shelters and contains you. And these are the latest structures where students are playing with computer-generated patterns in galvanized metal and in this case are building the simplest structure they possibly can out of rammed earth. So you take the earth on the site and you pack it together to create the structure that on the interior has these incredible spatial effects. I'm still figuring out how to photograph this. I'm waiting for Iwan Ban to come back and really capture uh, the cathedral-like quality of this space. And this is a student who is struggling, is that right there yet? Struggling to actually take uh, the, all of the debris that is piled up in the desert. And instead of making desert concrete out of stone, he's using all of the trash, all of the things that are on the site to begin to make a new architecture. So that's what we're doing at Taliesin. We're trying to figure out how to take this incredible legacy of Frank Lloyd Wright, in which we live and work every day, and build it further so that we can figure out how to make a world that is more sustainable, more beautiful, and more open. I invite you all to come visit us and to send us your best students. Thank you. So before going into the questions and the thoughts and whatever, I thank Aaron for the memento of his presence here. Oh, thank you. And uh, you can use it. Oh, so wow. And I mean, we have lottery. Thank you. I mean, it's a lottery girl again. Uh, oh, we have a new bag. Yes. Where is the old one? You lost the bag. You can oh. pick up anyone you like. <laughs> Just one. Yeah. Okay. This is the first winner. Ooh. My partner. Should we go now? Which one do you want? This one, this one, or this one. You have Tur Turkish, English, Arabic. He wants that one. <laughs> that is yours. Yes, I mean another one. Another one. Yeah, he's 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 a com. Again! <laughs> Human Bashar Hunt, once again. <laughs> which, which one do you want? This one? Yes. English or Turkish? English one. English one, okay. <laughs> one? Thank, you. Thank you. Oh, this will look really bad. <laughs> yes. F-style, again. <laughs> <laughs> He's doing something. <laughs>